Well, hello and welcome. It's wonderful to see greetings come in from all over the world. My name is Caitlin Thomas, and I'm part of the global marketing team here at National Geographic Learning. And thank you for joining today's webinar, What's New in World English 3rd Edition? Now, before I introduce today's speakers, just a few housekeeping notes. As always, we do recommend attending today's session with a strong internet connection. We know that this is not always possible, but it does prevent some connectivity issues that attendees sometimes experience. Now, if you lose sound or can't see the PowerPoint at any point, we do recommend closing the window and re-entering the webinar room through the link that was emailed to you. If for any reason you are disconnected, don't worry. We will send along a link to a recording of today's session and the slide and a certificate of attendance. We will be making this session interactive through multiple choice polls and questions in the chat box. And we look forward to your participation in this session. And lastly, we do have a short survey that you'll be directed to at the end of the webinar. And we'd love to hear your feedback and it will help us to inform future sessions. So without further ado, I would love to introduce today's speakers. Today we are joined by John Hughes. John is a teacher, teacher trainer, and course book author. He has worked in ELT since 1992 and managed departments of business and teacher training. He currently combines a variety of roles, including part-time teaching, running online training courses, and lecturing on ELT methodology at Oxford University in the summer. He has written many books with National Geographic Learning, including Spotlight on First, Practical Grammar, Total Business Two, Success with Beck Vantage, Aspire, and the sixth level general English course called Life. He lives near Oxford and writes the blog www.elteachertrainer.com and is a contributor to the National Geographic Learning in Focus blog. We are also joined by Brendan Lane. Brendan is a senior development editor on the adult general English list at National Geographic Learning. He has an MA in Applied Linguistics from Boston University and a TEFL diploma. And he's also participated in numerous TESOL approved training courses. Brendan has worked in educational publishing for 12 years and also has teaching experience in the US and Thailand. He also serves on the board of the Barrio Planta Project, an organization that brings free supplemental education to students in Mexico and Nicaragua. So without further ado, I'd love to turn it over to Mr. John Hughes, and he will get us started. Thanks to all, and enjoy the webinar. Thank you, uh, Caitlin. I hope you can all hear me. Very nice to see so many of you here this morning. I recognize quite a few names from previous webinars and perhaps from travels and so on. So it's nice to see uh, some of you coming back. So the webinar is going to go quite quickly. We want to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, the, the webinar is obviously going to focus on the third edition of World English, and we're going to talk about what's new in the series. We'd like to start off with a poll, because we've currently got 141 of you in the room. We'd like to know something about you. So uh, we're going to bring a poll over, which you can see on the screen. And we'd like you to choose the descriptor that best represents you. So you might be somebody who's very familiar with World English. Maybe you've used the second edition. Uh, maybe you've seen World English before, and you're thinking about it. Or maybe you've, you don't really know much about it, and you'd just like to know more about the series. If you're clicking none of the above, I'd be really interested to know what your interest is in the webinar. Just maybe type it in the chat box. Uh, if you're familiar with World English, maybe just type in the chat box who you've used it with, which level, what sort of students. Just any supplementary information about how you've used World English or why you might be interested in it. I can see we've, we've got a big majority of people who are not familiar with it and would like to know more about the series, which is absolutely great, because um, we're, we're going to tell you about the series and also tell you about new things as well. But we seem to have got the majority uh, 
Uh, somebody can't hear me. I hope the rest of you can hear, hear me. Um, we've maybe got a technical thing. So we've got teens in Laos using it, the second edition. Keep typing where you use it. Be interesting to know who you are and how you're using it. I'm going to briefly hand over to Brendan now, who's going to give you a quick overview of the program. And because we've got quite a few people in the room who are not familiar with World English, this will give you a bit of background on how the series is constructed. Over to you, Brendan. Yep. Um, I want to mirror what John said, and thank you all for joining us. It's a real pleasure to speak with you this morning. Um, so the World English program provides what our basic programs in the adult list provide. So we have a student book, teacher's book, workbook, um, online um, workbook so you can practice online, combo splits, which have half the student book and half the uh, workbook. Um, we also have things for the teacher, like the classroom presentation tool and exam view assessment suite, so you don't have to make your own tests, which is great. Um, and we also have online placement tests, so you can know what level of world English that your students should be going into. And yeah, back to okay. John for what we're going to, the four main points that we're going to cover today. Yeah, just to, just to support briefly what um, Brendan said as well, if you're not familiar with World English, it starts at an intro level, and then we have levels one, two, and three. Um, so there are four levels in the series currently, and level three finishes at a B1 level. Um, so that gives you an idea of the sort of intro level starts at beginner uh, A1 level and then works its way up. If you've never seen it before, th there are four levels. You're going to get a, a more of an idea in a minute when I start showing you some of the images uh, from the book. Basically, what we intend to cover, particularly in this session, is to look at the goals. World English is a book which is very goal-driven. Each les lesson is self-contained and it has a goal or an outcome that we're trying to achieve um, within the time for each lesson. Um, so we're going to look at how we address goals. We've also made some changes to grammar in the third edition, so we're going to explore what we've done to the grammar. There's a lot more flexibility in the way grammar's constructed in the book now. Um, the writing features in quite a big way in the third edition. Writing was in the second edition, but you're going to see that we've really expanded it and addressed the needs of 21st century writing. Uh, and also video is a key component in World English, and we've done a lot more to, to enhance it in the third edition. Those are the four key features we want to focus on. Um, if you want to know more about the book, obviously, you're going to have the chance to, to get more information um, at the end. And then we're going to leave some time for Q&A um, at the end of the session. So World English is a, a series aimed at uh, it's a general English course. Uh, and as I said, it's very goal-driven. When you open the book, when we think about what's new with the goals feature in World English 3rd Edition, when you open a unit, this is a unit from World English Level 1, you get a very striking image. We're obviously, we're trying to make contact with those visual learners. Um, but notice, I'm just going to point an arrow here at the bottom right-hand corner of the opening image. You've got a list of five unit goals. And that kind of lists what you're trying to achieve from the unit. And each goal, if you like, represents a lesson. So it's like having a, a lesson objective in your lesson plan. Um, it's very clear what you're trying to achieve from each um, lesson. Now, in the second edition, we took some of the teacher feedback, and we felt that the goal, our approach to the goals could be much tighter, and we could do more to reflect the goal of the lesson. So let's take a look more deeply at this. Um, here you've got a typical spread. This is also from Unit 9 on the topic of clothes. Um, but each spread or lesson has certain features. First of all, at the top there, you can see we state the goal clearly. This is what we want the students to achieve by the end of the um, lesson. 
But of course, it's not enough just to say that the aim of the lesson is so that you can use English to buy clothes. Students need to know what success looks like. And in previous webinars on lesson planning, I've talked about the need to show students what success looks like. So quite a few of the lessons give students model versions of what we want them to achieve. So in this lesson, students would listen to a conversation taking place in a clothes shop. So they're getting a kind of model of what we want them to achieve by the end of the lesson. So the goal is very clear. Students know what, what we're expecting of them. Another key feature of uh, World English Third Edition is the goal check. Now, in previous editions, the goal check was there, but it was much shorter. It maybe took up a tenth of the page. It was very brief. We've expanded uh, the goal checks so that there's more focus on preparation and practice. And it's very clear to students what success looks like and have they achieved it. So I talked about showing them what success looks like. The goal check tells them whether they've achieved that success or not. So we've really expanded in detail. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, another feature of the goal check is that I've, when I was writing the book, um, I came back to the second edition and I wanted the goals, um, the, the stages of the lesson to reflect the goals much more carefully. So what I've done to write the book is, is, a, is what a, an approach I would call backward planning, um, which I didn't invent, but it's very useful. And the basic idea is that you, you write the end of the lesson first, you write what is the task you want students to do at the end, and then you work backwards. Uh, Virginia, this is from the level one book. OK, thank you, Caitlin. Um, we've got the goal and we work backwards. Now, why working backwards, I'm thinking to myself, what's the content that the students need in order to achieve the goal? The danger is if you plan the goal and then you plan forward, that you, you kind of force the goal to become quite unnatural. And it's better to start with the end product and then work your way back. So we'll be kind of reflecting that in the book. And it's a technique you can use in your own lesson planning. I want to look closely now at the goal check. It's, it's an important feature of the book. And it's even more important in the third edition, because I said we'd expanded it. And you can see what we get in the goal check is usually there's some kind of preparation stage. So what we did in the second edition, students would be thrown straight in and have to perform or demonstrate that they could do the goal. What we've got now is much more scaffolding in the book. So there is clear, clear steps where students have thinking time and preparation time. So in this example, students look at this flow chart, which reflects the stages of a conversation in a clothes shop. And we don't say to the students, just do it. We say, work in pairs. Think about the language you'd need for each stage. Talk to your partner and prepare for it. And then in stage two, do it. And we think in that way it's much more teacher friendly and it's much more student friendly. And the, the, the outcomes will, be, will reflect um, the, the goals of the lesson uh, much more, more clearly. So I think if you've used the second edition before, one thing you're going to notice straight away in the third edition is that the goal check is featured more strongly, but also that students have been given everything they need in order to achieve their goals. There isn't that danger of maybe not having everything they need, or maybe covering bits and pieces of language that don't actually come into the goal check. It's a really important feature. So backward planning, showing them what success looks like, and that preparation that goes into the goal check. There's also two other aspects I'd like to mention about the lessons with the goals that I think is important, both in World English Third Edition, but also in teaching in general. Um, there are some comments about the goals. These are comments from people who've used the, the, the books already with the goal checks. And people like the fact that there are clear objectives, and then it's checked in the same lesson. Uh, and again, we get this thing of students checking their improvements. You've got the goal at the beginning, and then you've seen what success looks like. And by the end, you're able to check whether you've achieved it. 
But as you know, with National Geographic material, a key feature is authenticity and bringing the world into the classroom. And I want to show you an example of another page uh, with a goal check. This goal check was to plan a project. And I thought, rather than script it myself, why don't we talk to somebody real about planning a project? Um, and the picture you can, the person you can see in the photograph is the wonderful Molly Farrell. She's a photographer. She's done lots of work with uh, elephants in particular. Um, but she's always planning projects. So I thought it would be interesting to interview her about what it takes to plan a project. Um, so we interviewed Molly. And then we used the, the listening um, in the material. Uh, to show students what, what we want them to produce and talk about. Um, and then by the end of the lesson, students have to plan their own project. So it's that idea of showing them what success looks like, but we're using uh, an authentic context so students can see there's a reality to what they're doing. It's not just the teacher saying, and now class today, you're going to plan a project. It's actually saying, here's a real person planning a project. This is some real language you're going to need. OK, can you do it as well? Let's find out in the goal check. OK, so that, that authenticity is really important. Um, I also want to flag the fact that within these lessons, because it's often missed out, we've got pronunciation in the book. So students work on pronunciation features to help them achieve that goal at the end. I just think it's a key point, and often pronunciation is sometimes put as an extra in a course, but pronunciation is a really important aspect of World English. The other, the other key point about this is when we include authenticity and we include real people, typically National Geographic explorers and so on, we're talking about other parts of the world. And there's always that danger of personalization in the classroom. How does the student, for example, relate their own life to listening to uh, a National Geographic photographer who's working with elephants, say, in, in Africa. And to help both teachers and students deal with that personalization aspect, we've included, uh, this is an example from a reading page, but we've included a My World feature. And throughout the book, you'll see these little My World features pop up. And what we're doing is linking the authentic content to the lives of the students so they can really see a connection between what they're listening or watching in the videos you're going to see later to their own lives. So look out for the My World feature. It just makes the content but also the goals much more relevant um, to the students. So those are some key points about the goals. The goal feature is not new, but the way we've approached the goal feature is much more systematically. I think you'll find it much more thorough. And there's this sense of satisfaction and obviously motivation that comes from having lessons that really reflect key goals. So just to sum up on that, what's new with the goals? We're showing students what success looks like through what I call uh, visible goals, if you like, making the goals uh, real to the students. Use of backward planning. Our approach has been to sort of start at the end and work backwards. And that ensures that we get all the language in. Greater scaffolding of the final task. There's more preparation stages. So we give, we're making it fairer for the students, really. Um, and we've added authenticity but also managed to personalize it with the My World features. So it's, it, I think it's a really uh, a useful part, a useful new feature of the third edition of the goals. OK, I'm going to hand over to Brendan now, who's going to talk a little bit about the grammar in the third edition. Thank you. Um, and before I go over what's new with the grammar, I just want to ask you all a quick question. Um, think about when you teach grammar in your classrooms. Um, how often have you had to supplement the grammar, either with worksheets or with sections of another book or with extra activities that you've come up with? Um, you can just let us know in the chat or just kind of think about it, um, what kinds of challenges you've run into um, when you're teaching grammar. Um, in this first thing we're going to show you is a page from the previous edition of World English. And we would teach 
um, the presentation here. And then it would be a chart with some examples and um, some model language and some um, kind of formal information to help students be able to form the language and use the language. And then below that, we would have the practice. And that would typically be one or two activities that were, um, you know, like one formal activity, then one kind of more open-ended activity. And then we would have the context of the grammar, which would be a conversation before students would go on to the goal check. And this was kind of a really, really successful way to approach it. Um, and we found it very effective. But one thing that we found when we were talking to students, when we were talking to teachers, is that we had a lot of people that wanted more practice with the grammar. So this is a page from the new edition. So we still have this presentation here, but one key thing that we have added for this edition is that there's this point of use um, chart here in the book, but then there is also this new appendix in the back of the book. So this is an approach we've tried in other series and found it very successful. And basically it's an expanded grammar chart in the back. So you can see that this is much more robust than the chart we had in the main unit. And then there are three activities here helping students practice that grammar. So this gives students um, the expanded charts with usage notes as well as that extra practice on the basic aspects of the grammar. And this section is not necessary to complete the main practice and production in the unit, but it gives teachers the flexibility to assign extra practice for homework or pick and choose the grammar points where they think their students may need to cover that extra practice in class. Um, the main thing here is that this offers teachers flexibility. So some teachers might use this entire appendix, which has three or four activities for each grammar point that's in the main unit. Some teachers might use half of them. It's really up to the teachers and it gives the teachers that flexibility to assign these as they see fit. And then getting back to the main unit here. So we still have this shorter chart in the book, but importantly, now that so much of that practice that is kind of more formal practice where students are getting to know the grammar point a little bit is covered in the back, we're allowed to focus more on communication in the main unit. So this gives students more of a chance to use the, natural, the language in natural ways. And it really gives students more opportunities for personalization to use this language that they're learning to talk about things that are important to them. Um, so this gives us that same basic structure we had last time with the presentation, the activities in this context, and then the goal check. But now we have built in these opportunities for more authentic communication. And with those extra um, formal activities in the back of the book, we're really giving students more confidence too. So when the students are being asked to do these communication and personalization activities, they really know the language and they've, they've been able to practice it. So they're confident in talking about um, things in their own lives using that language. Um, and to mirror what John said about the goals, we think what that means is by the time they get to the goal check, which here, um, the grammar point here is using should for advice. And then they have these communication activities with should. Then they get the context of should um, to give advice in a conversation. And then they get to the goal check which is giving travel information, travel tips about your country. So talking to someone who might be visiting and using should. So by the time they get to that goal check, they've had all the preparation that they need to be confident um, in being able to communicate when they get there. So this grammar approach really kind of backs up that um, approach reviews for the goal check. So students are well prepared by the time they get there. 
Um, so just to sum up these main points about the grammar, we have expanded charts with basic activities in the back of the book. And like I said, the, the important thing here is that this gives teachers flexibility and it gives students confidence. And that's really, those are really the two things that we had in mind when we were um, planning this appendix is flexibilities for the teacher and confidence for the students. And in doing so, we can have a more communicative focus in that main unit. So this allows for students to encounter grammar in different ways and really use that language to personalize and talk about things that are important to them. It's not just about going through drills and, and knowing how the grammar is used, although that's important and we give the practice they need to do that. It's giving students that opportunity to use the grammar to talk about things that are important to them. And I'm going to kick it back to John to talk about what's new with the writing. Okay, thanks, Brendan. Um, what's new with the writing in World English is a little bit like saying, well, what's new with writing in the 21st century? When I first started teaching, course books tended to teach very formal letters and essays. And maybe in the chat box, I'd be really interested to hear what kind of writing text types can you hear me now? Thank you for that. You just let me know the microphone needs. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, thank you. Um, what's new with writing in World English is a little bit like what's new with writing in the 21st century. So uh, when I started teaching, uh, course books had formal letters and essays. I'd be really interested to know uh, in the 21st century what type of writing text types you think your students need to write in English or perhaps what text types uh, you teach them. For example, I'm guessing that most of you probably teach email language possibly. Any other types of language or text types in particular? Just have a little type through those and then we'll, yeah, blog, writing for blogs, email, WhatsApp messages. CVs, yes, yeah, CV writing's useful and that's in World English 3rd edition. We've included email writing, blog entries, more formal messages, yeah, narratives, reviews is a nice one, cover letters, advertisements. Okay, all those text types that you're mentioning we now have in World English 3rd edition, which perhaps we didn't have um, in the 2nd edition. What's interesting to look at, when you look at the second edition with writing, uh, we had one page dedicated to it. And if you look at this example from the second edition, there's writing down at the bottom. So actually, the second edition only looked in writing in a very basic way. It would say, for example, write five sentences. And in fact, a lot of the time, it was just practicing grammar from the unit. It wasn't presenting writing as a text type. Um, but user feedback told us that teachers said, well, hang on. Writing is still an important part of our students' lives. We write in the 21st century. I think what's slightly different is the fact that writing is perhaps integrated much more with the other skills. So you can't treat writing as this isolated activity. So the relationship between communication on the page, there was always a communication activity in the second edition which involves speaking in some way or some kind of speaking activity. Communication was always linked to writing. So we always wanted to uh, keep that in, but we obviously wanted to expand the focus on writing and make it much more relevant. So, there on the screen you can see the second edition. Now let's have a look at the third edition. And straight away you can see differences. Down at the bottom you can see um, here in this example uh, from a unit in level one, it's gone to two pages instead of one, so we've given it the status that it needs. 
We've still got communication and writing, because as I was saying, they're, they're interlinked. We don't want to treat writing as an isolated skill. It's connected. That Writing usually comes out of an activity. Maybe we've been talking about something, and then somebody goes off and writes something. Um, what we did is, because we gave it two pages, we could suddenly give space to the communication and we could give space to the writing. So there was a lot more breathing space for things to develop. So for example, with the communication, we made the speaking activity or was something where there would be a writing task that would follow in some way or that was integrated with it. In the second edition, sometimes the communication activity seemed like something separate from the writing. In the third edition, the two things are very closely linked together, and one follows out of the other, which means when you open, if you like, the writing page, you've got very clear, uh, you've got a very clear lesson. It, 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 it's very self-contained as a lesson. Um, and then with the writing, on the facing page here, um, we've got developing a writing skill that leads to the goal check. So there we've got the goal check at the bottom, but we've included a writing skill feature. So picking up on an area of writing that students need to develop within the context of a text type. So in this lesson, it's looking at a questionnaire or survey type which in the 21st century is useful for students because they might have to do surveys or questionnaires in their academic studies. If they're doing any kind of research paper, they might want to do a survey or research, an online survey uh, with people to get data. Or in the workplace context, they might be doing a customer survey or getting staff feedback on something. So the skill of writing a questionnaire is actually something they will genuinely need uh, in real life. And there you can see you've got a complete lesson which, which starts off with uh, students doing a questionnaire activity, then analyzing the language used, so types of questions, and then trying to put it into their own words, and by the end, developing their own questionnaire. So anybody who's seen the second edition will find this quite a big difference, but we really think we've improved it and given you very complete lessons that are quite integrated and will develop students' writing skills properly. Um, let me show you another example. Uh, this is from a unit on food. So students, the communication activity is a food game. The other thing I felt about some of the activity types in the second edition I wanted to make them slightly more fun, more active, so we've included some, some quizzes, some games, some role plays, so this is a nice sort of food game activity. And then out of the game, the writing skill is to get students to, to write a set of instructions, because of course the instructions for the, the, the game has instructions, um, but there's also instructions for cooking and recipes, so we analyze that language type. And then in the goal check, students actually get a choice. They can choose between writing instructions for a recipe, a game, or how to get to your house. So we're giving students the opportunity to vary things and personalize the writing a little bit, rather than only giving them one way to do it. And I want to, really want to draw your attention. If you can read it on the screen, this page is particularly Good. One thing we've really introduced a lot in World English 3rd Edition is peer review. So in this activity, students do their writing, and if you can read it, that last exercise says, exchange instructions with a partner, can you understand each other's instructions? So students write, then they swap over the writing, and they check it, and they give each other feedback. And that support, that approach to supportive learning is obviously so important. And it's, it's something that we brought in more and more with the, with the writing in the third edition. So I think you'll find it, it very beneficial in terms of the writing lessons you do. Um, I think basically it speaks for itself in terms of the amount of space and the time we've given to writing. A bit of feedback, the communication exercises and all the writing exercises um, as Stephen says, in Japan, they're more natural, they're more plentiful. There's just more of it, basically, um, and it'll give you much more chance uh, to develop those speaking skills and writing skills and treating them as something integrated. 
So to sum up that, what's new with writing? Two pages instead of one, so it's a complete lesson. I think the link between communication and writing is much clearer. Um, we've defined the writing text types and the writing skills, so there's a clear reason for doing writing now. It's not just covert grammar practice or language practice. You are actually producing a real text type. And again, once again, the goal checks are visible because we provide a model of what we want the students to produce by the end. They see a model version and then they try to produce it themselves. And it's much more scaffolding because of the writing skill. Okay, and we're on to our final point with Brendan, which is video. Hi. Um, so, being a National Geographic learning, obviously video is um, a significant part of what we do, and that's no different for this program. Um, previously, we had one page for video in World English, in the second edition at least. I know those of you who have been using it for a long time remember that in the first edition it was two pages. Um, so for this edition, we have gone back to that two page format. And we really feel that what this does is it allows us to kind of exploit the content in the videos and go beyond simple comprehension activities, which is kind of what we focused on last time. And we're really building students listening, viewing, and critical thinking skills um, using these videos, using authentic content to build those skills. Um, and it's important to know that this video will reinforce the messages of the unit, but it's not necessary to complete the unit. It's, it's um, something that's there for the classrooms that can show video to really reinforce what students have learned throughout that unit. Um, so you can see here um, that we have double column activities where we just had the one column previously and that we end here with students really doing a role play. They're imagining they're a journalist and they're coming up with questions um, for um, the person the video is about and doing a role play about that. So it's really exploiting this video to get at some of those communication goals and language goals that we've been focusing on in the unit. Um, and for this edition, we have new videos from National Geographic. Um, and this allows us to show students places around the world and some of the more exciting National Geographic projects that are going on right now. So these feature explorers like this one. Um, this is climber Alex Honnold. I don't know if any of you are familiar with him. Um, he made a documentary last year that I mean, got really famous here at least. Um, I think they won an Oscar. So we get access to people like that through National Geographic. Um, we also have access to the work of photographers, like this video featuring Anan Varma. And this is a unit that goes over projects and things like that. So it talks about how he planned for this project where he was going to film hummingbird, hummingbirds in very high definition. So you can see their wings moving and everything. So we show students the process and how he did that. And then we show that, that end result. And again, you can see this two-page format allows us to do all these comprehension activities but then at the end, really apply that language to do more communicative, critical thinking type activities. And we also get to show students places around the world. Um, so this one is from China. And again, you can see this extra space really allows us to get at these activities over here. Previously, we had mostly these comprehension activities. This new two-page format allows us to really give students a chance to interact with this content and talk about how it makes them feel and talk about how it might be, um, how it might apply to their own lives and, and really do some critical thinking and communication using these skills that they've learned um, through the video. And for people who used the second edition, 
um, you're probably aware that we introduced TED Talks. And we feel that this was really successful to give students these examples of authentic real world speech that wasn't completely scripted. It was people just giving their talk and talking about these big ideas that are changing our world. Um, and we feel that this was very successful. But one thing that we did run into, especially at the intro and um, level one, was that some of these talks were a little difficult for students. I don't know um, if anyone that used the previous edition ran into that, but we did talk to a lot of teachers and some of the talks were just a little difficult. Students could follow most of the language and get some of the big ideas from the TED Talk, but some of it was just beyond their grasp. So what we did with this edition for intro in level one is that we reached out to some of these TED speakers and we worked with them to create on level versions of their TED talks. So these talks are um, semi scripted to be on level. We still got the speakers to talk naturally but we also had them recycle vocabulary and grammar from the unit where they could. So by taking these talks, this kind of brings the TED talk to the student's level. And it allows students to be challenged and think about the ideas from the TED speakers, but now it's in a language that they can really understand and respond to. Um, so really the, the big thing was that we wanted to make these big ideas that we really found so inspiring from the previous edition, but make them accessible to students at all the levels. So the, previously the level two and three students could understand the TED Talks, but now we feel with these new talks, all of the students can really get that full experience. Um, and we're just going to show you an example of one of these. It's about two and a half minutes long. And this is from a speaker named Taye Selassie. Um, and she gave an interesting talk about where she's a local. Um, and I think you'll, you'll get most of it here. But just a warning before we watch it that there might be a little bit of lag um, between when she's talking and, and when you actually hear the word so there might be a little lag but we still feel like you'll be able to see what we mean with these new talks people often ask me this question where are you from it's a difficult question am I from Ghana my parents live there but I do not Am I from the United Kingdom? I was born there, and I have a UK passport, but I didn't live there long. Am I from the US? I lived in Boston for 12 years, and New York for six, and I have an American passport, but I do not live in the US. Am I from Portugal? I live in Lisbon, but I am not Portuguese. So the question, where are you from, is very difficult to answer. Maybe a better question is, where are you a local? It's better because it's about me, a person, and not about a country or a passport. For example, I am a local in Accra, where my parents live. I go there every year with my twin sister and we spend time with our mother in her garden. I am local in New York, where my best friends live. I visit the city at least twice a year. I am also local in Rome and Berlin, where I lived for three years each. I am a local in Lisbon, where I live now. What makes these places local for me? It is the people I love who live there. Let's try it with my friend, Olu. Olu is 35 years old. His parents are from Nigeria, but Olu was born in Germany. He studied in London. 
and now he lives in Berlin. He speaks English with a German accent and German with a Nigerian accent. So where is Olu from? Maybe the next time someone asks you, where are you from? Don't say the name of one country. Tell them where you are really from. Tell them about your family and friends. Tell them. Okay, so I'm sorry that for some of you, a good amount of you, it looks like, um, the we had some problems with the platform there. I hope those of you that could watch the video enjoyed it and saw what we mean. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry that that didn't work for some of you. But really, I want to stress that what it is, it's a, it's a scripted talk from a TED speaker that's more accessible for students. So to sum up what's new with the video, we have new scripted videos with TED speakers at the lower levels. We have updated National Geographic content from around the world. And the video page is now two pages instead of one making it a complete but an optional lesson. And these are just two quotes from users who have been using these new videos. Um, the video is intense, even though the language used is simple, and that's from Brazil. And the video content is a lot easier to understand than previous World English videos I've seen. And yeah, I want to go back to John to just kind of sum up these four main points that we've been talking about. Okay, so the key, the key features we've pulled out, obviously there's a lot more to it, but the key features, if you pick up the books, you look at them, notice the goal checks, they're there to increase student motivation. Uh, students know exactly what they're trying to achieve. We think we've added more flexibility to the grammar support, which obviously helps with teaching mixed abilities. Um, writing with communication, reflecting this idea that writing is integrated with the with other types of communication skills and also to reflect the text types that are important and also using video with authentic models of English. We think this is really important to expose students to real English, real authentic English and not just accents and voices from the usual countries like the United States and Britain. They're voices from all over the world, so students are getting real exposure. We hope and we think all of this leads to the fact that World English provides students with the motivation to talk about something that's, things that are important to them. We're always, by the end of the lesson, bringing it back to the students, giving them the chance to personalize take the language they've seen used elsewhere and make it reflect their own lives. Okay, we're going to hand over to Caitlin for questions. Apparently we have quite a few, Caitlin. We do, we do. And John and Brendan, thank you so much for that session. And we'd like to take the remaining 10 minutes to open it up to questions for our co-author, John Hughes, and our editor extraordinaire, Mr. Brendan Late. And we would, um, actually, I can kick it off with a couple of questions while you acclimate yourselves to the Q&A box right over here um, that Emily has just brought into the window. So feel free to type in your questions. And to get us started, though, I'm going to, I was monitoring the chat box while we were, uh, while the team was presenting. And we have a couple of really great ones to kick it off. Um, now, let's start with, uh, okay, um, Marte had a nice one, talking about differentiating tasks for students at different levels and abilities. I thought that this was a nice one to start it off because so many of us have the multi-level classroom. We know that is a reality. And this came at uh, the point of the presentation where we were talking about grammar. So I'm not sure if you were talking, Marte, about a uh, particular grammar point, but maybe we can talk in broad strokes about differentiation for the multi-level classroom. John or Brendan, do you have anything uh, that you can think of off the top of your head for that? So um, I could jump in here and say that 
one of the things that I think that grammar appendix can help with is a classroom like that. So really, we have we have different differentiated instruction kind of built in with that because we have those more basic activities for students that might need more reinforcement. And we also have those more communicative activities for students that um, are ready to jump right into that. So there are opportunities for reinforcement built into the book right there. Um, and, and I think that that kind of approach would be helpful for classrooms like that. I also Certainly. think as well as the... Ahead, no, I was John. just going to add clearly with the, with the grammar, I think the way we've added the extra grammar that addresses the issues Brendan's mentioned and, and, and it makes it much more flexible. But I also think the attention we've paid to the goal checks with the preparation stages and the scaffolding means that if you've got quite strong students working with students who are finding it harder, if they get together in pairs and they prepare the conversations and the goal check outcomes together, you've kind of got those support mechanisms going on in the classroom rather than in the past you might have had a situation where you just throw students into the final goal check activity and students who are finding it harder just don't have the opportunity to prepare and keep up. Um, because of the scaffolding and the preparation stages now, there's much more likelihood that they can and that the teacher also has the time to address those needs. That's also true for the writing skill now because there's a lot more scaffolding and space given to that kind of preparation. And also in addition with the video content, the videos themselves have extra additional information and exercises that help students who need further support. So I, I really think we've addressed that issue quite quite a lot with the third edition. And there Excellent. are also Thank opportunities you to both. For, the, for the schools that um, use the online workbook. There are also plenty of opportunities for reinforcement there as well with, with digital activities for students to really get the grammar reinforced. And they're, they're different than what you find in the student book. So they're new activities, different types of activities to really hit that grammar from, di from different angles so students um, of different level skill levels can can really get that grammar reinforced. Great. And this is a related topic. Virginia is asking about any suggestions on the flipped classroom approach. And I think that each of the items with particular respect to the grammar that you mentioned works well to uh, to kind of dip a toe into the water of the flipped classroom approach, which is really, increasing meaningful communication in the classroom. Um, anything that you can do to um, assign some of that grammar pre-work using that new grammar appendix or the online workbook to get some of those less communicative tasks as pre-work or homework or independent work and use the classroom time to really apply those skills in a communicative setting. We've offered a lot of flexibility in that respect, with particular respect to the grammar appendix and the online workbook. So Virginia, I hope that that gets at your question as well. Stephen asks another question, kind of going down a different area, um, about authentic speakers. And the uh, he was wondering how that works around the speakers, you know, kind of mix of um, first native language speakers as well as non-native speakers wondering if there's any difficulty in understanding those and how that works within within this program. So uh, we'll, 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 go ahead, John. Go on, Brendan. You go first. OK, yeah. I was just going to say that um, with these authentic speakers, especially at the lower levels, we've really, we haven't necessarily always told them exactly what to say, even though we have in a couple cases. Um, but we've really coached them as far as what kind of students they're going to be speaking with. Um, like with uh, Molly, for example, who, who John presented, her and I spoke on the phone for about a half an hour before we did the recording. And, and she was really open to the, the kind of leveling we needed, the kind of language we needed to use. And that's the same with other um, explorers that we worked with on this project, like I always spoke to them before um, they did any kind of recording to let them know, 
And with a couple of them, we had to, after they did the recording, we had to have them redo it based on that. Um, and, and for the new talks we've done with the TED speakers, um, I think with Taye, there was, there were probably, you know, 20 emails or so back and forth. And then one of our editors actually went and sat with her while she was recording that talk to kind of make sure everything stayed on level. Um, so some, some of the speakers, their ideas are naturally at quite a high level, but we always sat with them or talked with them and made sure that we could get them at the level that we needed to make the, what they're saying comprehensible for students. Great. It's also worth adding, I think, as well with National Geographic, the kind of people we're approaching, TED Talk speakers, uh, National Geographic people, they're international communicators, so they travel a lot, they speak to many different people from different languages using English, so they've already got a kind of high level development of the skills you need to communicate internationally, they, they understand the difficulties, and off, you know, usually they're also language learners themselves, so they understand the need to adjust language and so on to, to help listeners. One other feature you didn't see on the Thai Selassie at the beginning of that video, we went out with a camera into the streets of Lisbon and just interviewed people in the street and asked them where they were from. And normally if I scripted that as an author and said, where are you from, I'd probably go, like, I'm from Brazil, finish. At, at level one, but of course real people don't answer questions like that, so we went out in the street and we approached people who were working there, living there from different countries, and none of them really said, I'm just from and the name of the country. They kind of gave you a little bit of backstory, and in general, it was sort of short chunks of English that at that level students can cope with it, and it's exposing students to real English, so I think with the books, Yes, there's still scripted vocabulary, in, scripted dialogues in there with actors recording it, but that's balanced with the authentic kind of language that you get in the video and some of the listenings. And I, I think it's achieving that balance that's important. Great. Thank you. And one last question before I summarize just a little bit, because I think this is a really important one, um, around the goal check section. And this is a really important implementation question. And the question comes as, you know, are we, you know, how are we supposed to use that? Do you envision using this best at home, as a follow-up activity, in the classroom? Where's the best place and how is uh, the goal check section intended to be used? So we're we going for that, Brendan. You're asking me, so how do we expect the goal check to be used? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. right. I mean, in terms of its, its, for example, it would it would come at that lesson. It's checking that they've achieved that success. But equally, I think a, might, a teacher might find that they use it more than once. For example, you might do the goal check once, give the feedback, and then repeat it. Um, there's so it, there's various ways in which you might use it in that way. You, you could either, I mean, I, I piloted the materials, for example, and when I use the goal check, I might even record a conversation with the students, and they listen back to the conversation they had, and they, they self-correct. But it's, 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 so it's, it's sort of self-monitoring their own performance on the goal check as well. Sure, great. No, that's good. And so really, um, I think in terms of an implementation suggestion, using it communicatively in the classroom is a great way to do it. So you're really understanding how the students are able to apply. Folks, we are at um, a time where I'd like to summarize just a few of the basics that have come in, the basics of the questions as a reminder. This is a general English program attended for young adults to adults. It is four levels from the A1 to B1 uh, proficiency levels on the CEFR. And it is all available currently. 
and we are happy to uh, direct you at the end of the session to the uh, National Geographic Learning website where you can learn more materials about or learn more information about World English. And you can also contact your, Emily's put it in the chat, your National Geographic Learning representative, your local one. And the last question, just to summarize, do any of the videos have subtitles? All of our videos have the subtitle option as well. It's a great question, and it's, uh, it's certainly an important one. So just a couple of notes. Uh, thank you to all for your participation. We greatly appreciate it. And these are really good um, comments. If you want, we will um, continue to ha keep the chat line open as I exit here. and We can answer just a couple of more quick questions through the chat box. We will be emailing you all the PowerPoint slides and a recording of this session in the next few days. If you enjoyed today's session, please visit eltngl.com forward slash webinars to learn more about upcoming webinars for adults, teens, and young learners. You can subscribe to our InFocus blog at elt.ngl.com forward slash InFocus for more teaching tips in the ELT classroom. We have a survey that you'll be directed to, and we'd love to hear your feedback. And we also invite you to join our online community for teachers of English and our social media channels where we offer up-to-date information about live and virtual events, practical classroom tips, exciting real-world content, and new product information. Thank you again to John and Brendan, our speakers today, and thank you all for your participation around the world. We greatly appreciate it, and we look forward to seeing you all on our next webinar. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you.